So, yeah. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, at least virtually. Uh, and I'm excited to, to talk about multi-planet system architectures today and the connection between warm supers and cold Jupiters. And I'm going to do that mainly from a theorist point of view as my results are based on a synthetic planet population from our formation model. And this model has uh, mainly been developed by my collaborators in BAM. And so I'm in debt to Christoph, Remo, Alexandre, uh, Jan, Willi, but also to my PhD advisors, Hubert and Thomas for their great support. Uh, this really has been a team effort. Uh, and I, I also think that uh, there's been a lot of exciting results lately that reminded us uh, that planets come in a wide variety. But today I wanna to focus on two popular planet types, super Earths on close orbits and giant planets far out. So I guess it's best to define these types of planets in mass period space, where of course there is no universal consensus of what makes a super Earth and, and what is a cold Jupiter, right? And we also just adopted these limits from observational studies that reported a very interesting trend. What they what they did was they counted the numbers of systems that had either only one of these planet types or both. And they found that cold Jupiters uh, are enhanced in occurrence in systems that also have a super Earth. Or mathematically spoken, the conditional probability of having a cold Jupiter, given that there's a super Earth in the system, is higher than the probability of finding a cold Jupiter in any random system. And it also seems to go in the other direction. So it seems that the emergence of these planetary types uh, are somehow mutually beneficial. And of course, this doesn't tell us yet uh, if, you know, if once both planets form in the system, if they somehow have an actual, yeah, positive influence on each other, or if they just rely on the same underlying, yeah, beneficial conditions that makes planet formation happen. Um, uh, the observations don't tell us this. And of course, there are also observational biases involved. And so the actual numbers might be debatable, but the non-correlation case seems to be excluded. So can we understand this? Is, is this something our planet formation models can reproduce? And before I give you the answer to, to that question, I should tell you a little bit about what model our results are based on and, and what are the assumptions that we that we make and that our results are based on. So this is based on the, the so-called Bern model, a global planet formation model. Um, uh, global meaning that it tries to incorporate a lot of underlying physical mechanisms that are important for, for multi-planet formation. Uh, and it has been continuously developed over the course of many years. So I can really give you just some, some highlights and, and and highlight the key assumptions that are important for the results that I'm going to show you. I think most important is to mention that this is based on the core accretion paradigm. So the idea is that you first grow a solid core by accreting planetesimals. And once this core is massive enough, it can then also accrete additionally uh, a gaseous envelope. And uh, if you reach a certain critical mass, you can go into runaway gas accretion and grow all the way into a gas giant. And this model combines the evolution of a viscous accretion disk, including photo evaporation that disperses the gaseous disk in the end, uh, planetesimal and gas accretion onto up to 100 protoplanets that uh, grow in the same disk. Uh, we also solve for the interior structure equations. This is then very important for the long-term evolution of the planets. And if you, for example, want to compute transit radii giga years later, right? Uh, there's orbital migration. And especially for the terrestrial planet or, or all the small mass planets actually, super Earth as well, the n-body interactions between those uh, protoplanets uh, and also after the disk dispersed, their gravitational interactions are being tracked by an n-body. And this really defines the final system architecture. But for this project in particular, we also need to keep track of, of the compositions of planetesimals that we actually accrete. So, so we have this uh, equilibrium chemistry model that tracks the abundances of iron, silicates, and ice. 
So back to the question, how does our model compare to this observed trend that super Earth and cold Jupiters seem to uh, yeah, like each other and occur together? So the quantity again that we're interested in is this conditional probability of cold Jupiter uh, occurrence given there is at least one super Earth in the system. And this plot shows this quantity in blue for the distribution uh, of the observed probability. This is by Su and Wu 2018. And they didn't have a huge number of systems, but the distribution uh, of this probability centers around 30%. And this is really much higher than the observed frequency of finding any cold Jupiter in the system, which lies at around 10%. So there is, uh, it's really significantly enhanced. And if we compare this to the simulated systems shown in red here, we see that it's much lower there. In fact, it's only slightly enhanced to the non-conditional probability. So to this probability of finding a system with a cold Jupiter, we have, I think, around 14% there. This is this gray uh, patched area with the, with the dashed line. So why is that? Why is there this discrepancy apparently between our, our core accretion model and, and the observations? Uh, in the model, in the simulations, we have the convenience of being able to turn back time, so to speak. And so we, we did that and we saw that super Earths do form in nearly all systems that host an outer giant. But then they're frequently removed by, uh, by dynamically active warm Jupiter, so by giant planets that migrated to closer orbits and then threatened these inner systems of, of small mass planets. So our model actually seems to produce too many of these warm Jupiters. And let me just show you one example of, of such a system that created um, eccentric giant planets, because this is a very interesting example. And maybe I can try to stop it quickly for now. Um, so this is mass versus semi-major axis. And uh, you're going to see how, how all these 100 embryos that we start with, so we start with lunar mass, so-called planetary embryos, they accrete simultaneously. Each of the markers is a planet and they leave tracks in the plot and color coded is the ice mass fraction. In the core, we can ignore that for now, but it will become uh, very important later. And if you see a cross somewhere, that means that this planet has been eaten in a merger event and another planet uh, leaves on, uh, lives on, and uh, we're going to see how this this system is going to be depleted in planets, especially once some giant planets are going to form. And this will happen uh, at a few AU just beyond the ice line. We're going to see how some planets make it into runaway gas accretion. Right now, they grow, they become eccentric, they interact, and whoop, the rest of the system. It's basically gone now. So they became too dynamically active. And in the end, there are only these eccentric giant planets left. That's a very extreme example. And one way of resolving this discrepancy that we're seeing is really to make planet migration less efficient. If we would um, um, artificially inhibit planet migration, we get a better match. But we also find that these occurrence probabilities are very sensitive on our choice of mass period limits. So basically this, this definition I showed in the beginning of what makes a super Earth and what makes a cold Jupiter. Uh, so I think this is really something to, to keep in mind when one does these kind of counting experiments with observed data. Okay, so we have established that super Earths and cold Jupiters tend to form together and that this does not necessarily imply a common occurrence in the final systems. Uh, but we wanted to go one step further and ask, do super Earths with giant companions differ from those without? And to answer this question, I will now divide our population, the synthetic population, into two different groups of systems. Those systems that have both planet types, super Earth and cold Jupiters, and those systems that have only a warm super Earth, but no cold Jupiter. Let's have a look. Um, so here I plot these two groups in semi-major axis mass space again. And again, color coded is 
the fraction of water ice in the planetary core. Now this is becoming important because we found that on average, those super Earth with a giant companion, so this is the upper plot here, they um, have lower ice mass fractions than the ones without. And this is in particular true for the more massive planets, so also for the planets that we're more sensitive to in the observations. Uh, and that's of course an, an interesting trend. There's a, a link between the composition of these planets apparently and the system architectures. Uh, and if you want to test this, uh, you can ask yourself if, if some interesting, some measurable observables um, help you with that to test this prediction. And well, if you have different ice fractions, you will have different bulk densities of these planets. And so they will end up in different positions in the mass radius diagram. So we can turn this argument around and say, if you have detected a super Earth, you have characterized it, measured its mass and radius, can you use its position in the mass radius diagram to learn something about possible additional planets? So if we, if we try that uh, exercise and plot these two different populations in MR diagrams, and here I'm plotting only the super Earth, we see that they indeed occupy different regions in the plot. For your orientation, these two diagonal lines that you're seeing here, these correspond to rocky and icy cores without significant atmospheres. Uh, and well, only in the lower plot, you see two diagonals because this, this icy core population here is basically completely missing in, the, in those systems of super Earths that also have a giant planet in the system. But the system or the differences are even more evident for planets with atmospheres where this whole yeah, cloud of uh, icy cord planets that also have a significant atmosphere is completely missing in the other in, in the upper group. So this means there is apparently such a, a link between bulk composition of the planets and system architecture which makes of course a, an interesting prediction and we wanted to check if this is real and so I compared it with observed exoplanets, um, but it's, it's very important that what I'm, what I'm showing you now, I'm going to overplot observed exoplanets and their position in the mass radius diagram. But this is only the sample of confirmed super Earth that also have a confirmed cold Jupiter. So, so here it goes. Uh, the complementary sample, which would of course also be interesting, uh, is just too corrupted by biases. I don't know if uh, uh, if I go into that sample, if that cold Jupiter indeed doesn't exist in that system or is, if it just hasn't been detected. So uh, I did not dare to overplot this other group as well, but uh, the corresponding group, super Earths in systems with both planet types, they seem to fit the synthetic sample and they don't fit this complementary synthetic sample. So the lower plot as well. And so uh, that's reassuring. And um, yeah, it's nice how well it fits. But of course, this is not an unequivocal proof of our prediction. For that, I think we, uh, we have to wait until this MR diagram gets a bit better populated, which is, of course, happening right now rapidly with the current and future missions. Uh, but until then, we can at least yeah, open the hood and, and use our model to try and understand how this effect comes about. Where does this connection between, uh, between architectures and planetary composition come from? And we found that it goes back to different disk properties, different initial conditions in our model, uh, where the defining parameter is really the solid content of the disk. So this means this is the total amount, the total mass in uh, planetesimals that we initially give into the disk. And this is distributed differently for the two populations. So if we plot the cumulative distribution for these familiar two groups, again, red is super Earth without cold Jupiters, blue is um, those systems with, with both planet types. We see that those systems that uh, only have super Earths in the system, they started with intermediate mass disks, maybe a hundred Earth masses or so. Whereas on the other hand, these systems that in the end have both planet species in the system, they had much more massive disks. And if we now try and connect the dots uh, in the global picture, 
um, we, we see that there's basically two different channels that are happening. The first case is you start off with an intermediate mass disk, but it has to be sufficient for planet formation to happen uh, so that you do produce super Earths in the end. This is around 100 Earth masses, as, as just mentioned. Uh, and in this case, primarily icy super Earths form, and they migrate inwards to become uh, detectable icy super Earths. Uh, so we end up with systems of such volatile rich planets of low bulk density and no giants are formed. The other case is that you start with a much more massive disk with many hundreds of Earth masses. Uh, in this case, you can form cores also further in and they, they migrate inwards again and become dry super Earths. Uh, but the conditions are also right to form giant planets and these would then prevent icy core that formed further out from migrating inwards. And so in the end, we have systems of high density super Earths plus a distant giant planet. So if this mechanism really works in the way I described it just now, what are the implications of this? Um, well, the observations and also our planetesimal accretion scheme predicts a positive correlation between these two planet types and their occurrences but some pebble accretion models predict an anti-correlation here. So um, to remind you, pebble accretion is, is this, um, this mechanism where you, where you don't, uh, where not only accrete your solids via kilometer sized planetesimals, but also via millimeter to centimeter sized, well, yeah, pebbles. Uh, and they have the, the very, uh, important feature that they in protoplanetary disks typically have a Stokes number of unity, which makes them uh, drift inwards in the disk. So there's this steady flux of material coming in, uh, which the pebble accretion models rely on. And of course, if a giant planet emerges at some point, then it would cut off this pebble flux and starve the inner system. So this can also be used to constrain the timing of uh, the occurrence or emergence of such uh, giant planets and also to constrain the relative efficiency or importance between uh, pebble accretion and planetesimal accretion. Another aspect relates to planet migration. As we've seen before, we found that outer giant and inner super they do form together whenever the conditions are right globally but where super Earths are missing, the systems are typically destroyed by, by eccentric warm giants uh, and these planets migrated there. So one example is this TOI 2179b. This is a very eccentric um, giant planet, a warm giant 15 day period that we discovered in test full frame images. And uh, there are indeed, um, we, we checked this, there are no stable orbits for any interior super Earths in this system. But keep in mind that such objects are actually quite rare. So they're much rarer than uh, in our synthetic population. And so this might be a hint that migration is not as efficient as proposed. So I hope I have convinced you that inner super Earths and cold Jupiters are not independent from each other. And I want to finish with some key takeaways. First, our simulation shows that uh, initially these planet types basically always form together, but then frequently the inner systems are destroyed by dynamically active warm giants. And this could mean that we're overestimating planet migration. Uh, we also caution that such conditional probabilities are quite sensitive on the chosen mass period limits and on the detection biases involved. And secondly, um, if you have a super Earth that has a cold Jupiter in the system, it is on average less icy than feed super Earth. And this leads to the prediction that those with a high bulk density can be used as a proxy for giant companions in the same system. Once we connect this result to the formation phase, we can understand where this comes from. Intermediate mass disks enable the formation of icy super Earths, but no giants form more massive disks can produce rocky super Earths and can also produce giant planets. So once again, thank you for having me. Stay safe and 
keep distance to each other, but also remember to stay clear of eccentric warm Jupiters. Uh, thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you for the great talk. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to uh, raise your hand and I will call on you and you'll just be able to uh, unmute yourself and, and ask. Uh, while we're waiting for people to find that unmute button, I have a question. So you touched a, a bit on uh, the impact of, of, uh, not, of, of detection biases. Um, yeah. can, can you expand a bit more on, on how that impacts um, you, uh, specifically that, that first uh, point there? I, I, would, I would expect maybe uh, multi-planet systems to impact this significantly and then you just aren't sensitive mm -hmm. to that. So what we tried when we did the comparison, okay, I'm not sure I can find the right slide now, but um, when we did this comparison with the observed systems, so what I'm plotting here are basically all of our synthetic systems, no matter if they're detectable or not. But for the comparison, the probability distributions that I showed, we actually tried to have the same underlying detection bias as the observed sample, um, but without having um, say any you know, sophisticated injection and retrieval tests, we didn't have access to the raw data, so we couldn't do that. Instead, um, we estimated a certain RV semi image, a semi, semi amplitude in meters per second and remove those planets that fell beyond uh, below that. So this is how we made the comparison in the end. But we uh, saw that this, this probability distribution that I showed uh, in the synthetic population that this actually had a dependence on where exactly we set this detection limit, this, this limit of detectability in RV semi-amplitude. So it changed quite a lot. This is what worries me. If you, if you cannot quantify your sensitivity limits well enough, then this will influence uh, the probability uh, distribution that you would infer. Definitely. Thank you. So, so uh, just a, another follow-up. Um, did you, uh, you, you, so you did actually in your simulations include the, um, the inclination and, and the observability, and you excluded those from your simulations, the, the ones that were not detectable via transit? So this was on a, from an RV-based sample. So what we did was we computed for each of our planets the RV semi-amplitude, and then we distributed their orbits randomly in, in space, in 4 pi space. Uh, and then, so for each of these planets, we uh, indeed measured a, an, an RV value, so to speak. And then once it, it fell below the detectability limit, then we removed it and we didn't consider it for the comparison. Great, thank you. Uh, if there are no other questions, uh, let's go ahead and thank Martin again. And uh, we'll pass it on to the next speaker. Thank you, Martin. Thank you. Okay, so just a quick reminder that um, we are recording these talks and they will eventually uh, be posted on the YouTube channel of the CFA seminars. Um, so our next speaker is Victoria Strait. She is a finishing grad uh, student at UC Davis in California, working with Marusha Bradach. Uh, she works on very high redshift galaxies and the epoch of reionization, and she's going to talk today uh, about, I think, particularly the stellar population properties of these uh, galaxies. Uh, so why don't you start your presentation and go ahead. Okay, can you see that? Yes. Great. Um, yeah, thank you guys all for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, I'm going to be talking about some work that I've done with my advisor, Marusha Burdach, and some other group members, um, mostly Brian Lamo and Deborah Policia, as well as uh, several people in the RELICS collaboration, which is led by Dan Coe. Um, my talk is going to be about galaxies in the cosmic dawn and specifically what we can learn about them before JWST. So that mostly means Hubble and Spitzer, um, although I will mention some results from Keck. Um, sorry, my dog is misbehaving <laughs> um, at the end. 
Um, so I know that there's a lot of expertise here in uh, galaxy evolution, but I'm going to start out with a simple overview uh, to show you guys all where I'm coming from. Um, I'm going to start out with why I'm interested in studying galaxies at Cosmic Dawn. I'll go into a little bit about what we currently know, um, and then I'll describe uh, my method for searching for characteristic galaxies, um, and I'll end with a few interesting examples. So why do I want to study gal galaxies at Cosmic Dawn, which for the purposes of this talk is Redshift 6 and above? Um, to me, they're, they're sort of the first chapter of the story of galaxy evolution. Um, they're the progenitors of every type of galaxy that we see today, including the Milky Way. Um, they're the hosts to the universe's first stars. They're responsible for the reionization of neutral hydrogen in the IGM, and they likely have extreme stellar populations from what we've seen. Um, and this makes them good laboratories for being able to study new mechanisms of star formation that we don't maybe don't see at lower redshifts. So with the right data of these galaxies, we could learn a lot about um, the cosmic dawn, including ionization and ionizing bubble sizes, um, possibly see POP3 traces in galaxy spectra, um, constraining merger rates, and, and all of this is on top of just basic stellar populations. So uh, for a very cursory overview of why it's hard to answer the question of what galaxies at Cosmic Dawn look like, um, locally, we know we can see lots of details in galaxies taking step back to redshift point one and all the way to two. In that window, the picture gets significantly fuzzier. Taking another step back to redshift six and seven, um, we can pretty much no longer see structure and these galaxies turn into mostly point sources or in some cases, red fuzzy blobs. And then at redshift eight and above, it's sort of the same thing, except we can see many fewer galaxies. Um, and this is for several reasons, but one of them is that the neutral hydrogen is, is more common at, at high redshifts. And this means that any of the galaxies that we do see with the most successful Lyman, uh, emission line, Lyman alpha, are the biggest and brightest ones that have had, that are big enough for um, an ionizing bubble to be large enough for Lyman alpha to escape. So we do know something about the galaxies at Cosmic Dawn from the few detailed observations we have. Um, we've seen that they're generally metal poor, pretty small, uh, highly ionizing, irregularly shaped, star forming, not very dusty, young. Um, but we don't really have the sample size to be able to say any of this robustly. So uh, one approach to this has been to use imaging to select for high redshift characteristic galaxies, meaning not the biggest and the brightest. Um, one of the collaborations I've been working with during my PhD is the Reionization Cluster Lensing Survey, or RELICS. Um, it's one of several surveys to use galaxy clusters to search for characteristic gravitationally lensed galaxies. So with RELICS, we have um, these 41 massive galaxy clusters here in plotting mass and redshift. These were selected to be um, potentially have lots of high redshift objects behind them. Uh, they have Hubble and Spitzer data, 188 HST orbits, which was PI'd by Dan Coe, um, and over a thousand hours of Spitzer time with, uh, from PI'd by my advisor and um, some director's discretionary time. So besides high redshift galaxy science, there is a lot of other science going on in RELICS. Um, there's a big team of people doing uh, lens modeling and making magnification maps. There's people looking for supernovae and um, people doing galaxy cluster scaling relations science. So obviously I'm mostly focused on the high redshift uh, sample here, which I'm plotting. This is apparent and absolute magnitude versus redshift and in the pink points are our, our high redshift sample, which we've decided to cut off at redshift five and a half. Um, so these are all Hubble uh, Lyman break selected galaxies. Um, and Several of them, not all of them, have, uh, have been involved with spectroscopic follow-up programs. Um, our group is using Keck, MOSFIRE, ELRIS, and DEMOS on the, the best 10 clusters that are observable from Keck. And uh, there's also MUSE and ALMA programs looking at some of these. And although I'll talk about this a little bit at the end, I'm mostly focused on the Spitzer observations here, because while these were selected with Hubble for their redshift, um, Constraining stellar properties is uh, pretty much impossible without um, constraining the rest optical, which is redshifted into the near infrared here. 
just to drive this point home, uh, this is not a relics galaxy, it's just an example, um, but this is a spectral energy distribution fit, magnitude versus wavelength. The black points are data and the, the blue line is the best fit template. And in blue, I'm highlighting just the Hubble fluxes here. And over here, this is the statistical distributions of stellar mass, star formation rate, age, specific star formation rate. And then when we add, basically when we add these two fluxes over here from Spitzer, we can say something meaningful about these quantities. So unfortunately, getting Spitzer fluxes isn't as easy as just running source extractor. Um, it's a little bit more labor intensive than that. Um, and to show you why, um, I'm showing you a pretty HST image of one of the, the relics um, clusters. And then this is the corresponding Spitzer image. Um, so it's 10 times lower resolution, which in a lensing field um, provides lots of crowding issues, you know, due to the large PSF and low resolution. So to mitigate this, I have developed a pipeline that uses a code called TFOAT. Um, and I've made this little flow diagram to explain how it works. Um, it takes a high resolution image and a segmentation map, which in our case is Hubble and a low resolution image and error map, which in our case is Spitzer. And it creates a template for each galaxy using the Hubble image. So it degrades the Hubble image to be the resolution of Spitzer and creates a template of each object and then convolves that with the PSF of Spitzer um, and then solves for the best fit flux of each um, model image to, to match the real Spitzer image. And it outputs um, fluxes and um, uncertainties and diagnostics. Uh, and over here, I'm showing a, a GIF basically from the, um, I think this is from the TIFO website, but, and so it shows you the high resolution, low resolution model and residual images, um, but this is for a blank field. Um, and so our fields don't usually look this clean. Um, so instead of just running TIFO on the whole field, I actually, um, run TFOAT on very small fields of view uh, right around each high redshift object. And this accounts for any changes in background or ICL and things like that that happen in a cluster field. Um, so once the fluxes are extracted, then comes the stellar population modeling. Um, I won't talk too much in detail about this, but I did wanna mention that I have uh, two different methods for stellar population modeling that I've used in my most recent paper. Um, and I've color coded them because you'll see some plots in, in these colors in a second. Um, but the main differences are that we explore more parameters with method B and we use, we're using fairly different um, methods for minimizing. Um, and the other, the other differences are different templates and different star formation histories. So now that that, um, that part is out of the way, I can tell you about some exciting uh, galaxies that we found. The first exciting candidate that we found from relics was a spatially resolved redshift 10 candidate. You can see the photo over there. Um, and this is its uh, spectral energy distribution fit. Um, this, this star was the, the initial data that we got. And then we were able to, with deeper data, um, push down upper limits pretty far, although not quite as far as we would like to really constrain this part of the spectrum. Um, and this is due to some crowding issues next. Uh, there's a really bright nearby source. Um, but anyway, we were able to say something about the stellar properties of this galaxy. And this is where the color coding comes in. So the tan or yellow here is from method A and the green line is from method B. And the, the basic differences are listed here. Um, so since that uh, publication came out, we've actually received new uh, Hubble data for this object. So this is what the ARC looked like initially. And with our pretty new HST data, you can see there's three distinct clumps here. Um, and Danco has a grad student, I believe, modeling this galaxy. Um, this, these data also allowed us to uh, constrain the redshift even better, even just without Hubble, without Spitzer. Um, the, the redshift is even more confidently at, at redshift 10 now. So we're excited to, to follow this galaxy up. Um, the second exciting galaxy that we found uh, in relics was behind the cluster Abel 1763. Uh, and it is showing evidence of an evolved stellar population at redshift eight. 
um, and evolved is in quotation marks because at redshift date, the universe is only 700 million years old or 800 million years old. And uh, so it can't possibly be that evolved. Um, but this SED shows pretty good evidence of a Balmer break. And from our stellar population modeling, we see that it has a high chance of forming very early. Um, it's worth noting that this isn't the only one of these we found. This is just my, um, this is my example. Um, and this is the same story is true for this. Uh, this is one example of several galaxies that we found in relics that showed extreme nebular emission. And so this sort of has the opposite signature of the galaxy that I just showed you in that it has a boosted channel one Spitzer flux, um, which we think is due to uh, extreme O3 and H beta emission. Um, and when I say extreme, I mean in excess of a thousand angstroms. And so for this galaxy, we, we believe that it's um, probably a young and bursty galaxy. Uh, and the last, um, the last one I'll talk about was, is gonna be published separately. This, this paper should be out very soon. Um, it's a Redshift 7 extreme Lyman alpha emitter, which we've named Dichromatic Primeval Galaxy or DP7 for short. Um, we observed this with uh, Keck and Elriz last year, and this is led by Deborah Felicia and I. Um, we saw this gooming Lyman alpha in, in this pretty faint magnitude 27 galaxy. Um, and ended up measuring the equivalent width to be at least 200 angstroms. And, uh, and the Lyman alpha was spatially resolved. Um, we thought this was interesting just because of how intrinsically faint this galaxy is and also because the, um, the SED looks kind of curious for a um, extreme Lyman alpha emitter. It looks sort of old and dusty, which is not necessarily what you'd expect. Um, upon taking a closer look at the Hubble image, we saw two distinct uh, components in the F105 band. Uh, and then that popped out in the RGB image that we made. And also in the UV beta slope measurements that we made, the Northern component is significantly bluer than the Southern component. So um, we wanted to compare this to other extreme Lyman alpha emitters. Uh, and this is just a cartoon plot, but um, I'm showing um, Lyman alpha equivalent width and uh, intrinsic luminosity over here. Um, these guys are all extreme Lyman alpha emitters with, with emission at least um, 40 equivalent width, uh, 40 angstroms in equivalent width. Most star forming galaxies at these redshifts, uh, which is between six and a half and seven, are below 25. Um, and with the exception of this um, highly magnified arc from Benzel et al. from this year, uh, DP7 has the highest equivalent width. Uh, Lyman alpha measurement and is also the faintest. So um, after looking at these, uh, these studies and seeing what people suggested for um, scenarios, we, we decided that this was probably a galaxy that has formed an ionized bubble. Um, it could possibly have um, POP3 uh, in its stellar population. And if not, it's extremely metal poor. Um, and also several of these galaxies, including ours, we think show evidence for our merger. So um, ultimately our, our data here are still ambiguous, but we're quite excited to follow this one up too. So as I wrap up, um, right before I wrap up, I wanted to plug this, um, this most recent paper that I published, which is the results of all of the um, relics data. Uh, I, I not only published the paper, but I released the data publicly and it's available here at this website. Um, it includes the Hubble and Spitzer fluxes as well as the stellar population fits from both of the methods that I described. Um, and this is for 208 out of the 321 galaxies that were in the sample. And this is because the other 100 or so were just too close to either the cluster center or a galaxy cluster member for me to get reliable Spitzer fluxes from. And then these three plots are just some diagnostics to show you um, that most of the galaxies we see are characteristic. They range four magnitudes in stellar mass and age. Um, and so they're there if anyone wants to play with them. And so in summary, uh, I have used imaging from Hubble and Spitzer to constrain stellar properties of 200 characteristic galaxies at cosmic dawn. Um, and this includes a spatially resolved redshift 10 arc um, several galaxies with evidence for evolved stellar populations, but one at redshift date. 
Um, and the same is true for some redshift seven galaxies with extreme nebular emission, and then DP7, which is a redshift seven galaxy with evidence of an ionized bubble hosting a merger. Um, I'm really excited for the future for all of these data because while using imaging to do spectral energy distribution fitting and stellar populations fitting is cool, it's usually ultimately ambiguous. Um, so I'm really excited to be able to use spectroscopy from lots of telescopes, but including James Webb to uh, do more detailed science on some of these galaxies, including kinematics, ionization, uh, spatially resolved stellar populations and local environment. And I'm specifically interested in constraining star formation histories um, using James Webb data and combining that with cosmological zoom in simulations. Um, so that's something I'm thinking about now. Um, so that's it for me. Uh, I can take questions. Thank you. Very nice talk. I'm sure many people were inspired to write a JWST proposal right now. <laughs> there are still two weeks left, plenty of time. Um, so um, if you have a question, please raise your hand uh, on Zoom. In the meantime, I will go ahead with the first question. Uh, it's, it's very interesting to hear that a Redshift 8 galaxy shows possibly a Balmer break. And I've seen also a slightly lower redshift, other similar claims. So my question is, uh, do you need a declining star formation history or can you have that also with this constant star formation history? Yeah, um, it turns out that at redshift date, the, the star formation history that you use isn't especially important because there's just not very much time. Um, so you don't need a declining star formation history. You can have a constant um, the only the only star formation history that makes a huge difference to use is if there is nothing and then a, a very sharp burst right before um, the galaxy was formed, which is possible. Um, we just don't think it's very likely. Like you can see that uh, here there are some emission lines. So this could be due in theory to really extreme O3H beta, um, but it would have to be in excess of 2000 angstroms and um, it is definitely possible, but we, we think that the bomber break is more likely. Sounds good, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, Charlotte? Hi, Victoria. Hi. Uh, that was a nice talk. Um, I guess I have two questions. Um, and the first, I maybe missed it. Um, so I'm sorry if I have missed that and you already explained it. But I, I mean, you can see that in this plot um, that you, you talked about these two different methods for fitting, fitting the SEDs. Yeah. Um, could you talk a bit about why you, like what, and you know, at least in, in the plot that you just showed, it seemed like there were some discrepancies in the solutions for those. So do you yeah. have a sense of like, what was, what, what are the kind of biggest things that were driving the differences in the solutions? Yes, um, I could talk about this for a long time, but I think that the, the main differences were in, the fact that in method B, we allowed for a lot more extreme stellar populations, mostly because the machinery that I used, bagpipes, um, really allows you to do that easily. Um, so in my method A, I was using um, sort of a hacked version of easy with uh, BCO3 and nebular emission templates that I created using the BCO3 software, um, meaning that the, the nebular emission lines that come out of that are just from like line ratios, basically. Um, whereas in, uh, in method B, I used BPASS uh, templates and then cloudy modeling to do uh, nebular emission. And I allowed, I didn't put it here, but I allowed the ionization parameter to vary such that the nebular emission lines could be really extreme up to 10,000 angstroms. Um, and I allowed metallicity to vary and, uh, and also the star formation history here is variable, which means it could be it could have like the star formation history that I just described, like nothing and then a sharp burst. Whereas this is, um, this one's just basically constant. Um, and I, I also think that it has something to do with the way that the, the fitting is done, but I'm not as clear on that. So I, I'll just stop there. <laughs> okay, thanks. That sounds yeah. good. I think, yeah, at least having a lot more degrees of freedom is gonna give you. Yeah, and I, I think that yeah, just using the the BCO three 
and nebular emission templates that I was using before don't necessarily take into account the extreme stellar populations that could happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, that sounds great. That what you've been doing with the with five posts then, um, kind of moving beyond uh, what a lot of people have done before. I think using the simpler methods. Um, the other question I was going to ask was about the Lyman Alpha emitter, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, the high equivalent width is is pretty exciting, um, and I guess you were suggesting that. It, you know, especially for a galaxy this faint, that it probably has to live in a fairly ionized region to see that much Lyman alpha. Um, and so I was wondering how, if you have a sense of, well, I don't know, is it in an, do you know if it's in an overdense region? I mean, my, I guess my, um, my inclination is that it's, you know, that a galaxy that's that faint in UV continuum probably isn't capable of producing enough ionizing photons itself. Yeah, um, to carve out the bubble. Yeah. Yeah, we, this is something we're looking into. Um, it's, it's not totally clear, um, but in the field itself, uh, in the, the field that, that the galaxy's in for the Hubble and Switzer data that we have, we don't see any other uh, Redshift 7 galaxies. Um, so, well, that are, that are bright enough and, um, that could be, could be responsible for ionizing a region. Uh, but you know, there, that we can't rule it out basically. Like there could definitely be a galaxy nearby that we just don't have imaging of. Um, yeah, this is something we're, we're thinking about, but, um, I, I'd be interested to know if you have I, other ideas for how to rule this out, other than just looking around with the data that you have nearby. Yeah, I don't know. You just have to do deep imaging. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I guess the alternative is that it's like a very already a very extreme emitter. Like it has an intrinsic equivalent width of like five hundred or something, right. similar to um, the Van Zella object, and then it's and just that. That absorbed. could be possible. This, yeah. yeah, this 200 angstrom is a hard lower limit. No, it's really cool. Thanks. <laughs> we still have time for questions. In the meantime, I'll ask one more question. You, of course, JWST is going to be great because uh, it gives you much higher spatial resolution and deeper photometry. But I think you mentioned about something about JWST spectroscopy at the end. So are you really going to be able to detect the stellar continuum with JWST? Um, yeah, we might be able to, yeah, with, uh, with DP7. Um, this is because uh, the, so we're thinking of an IFE proposal for this thing and it wouldn't be, I don't think that it's really realistic to be able to detect the continuum uh, Spatial, spatially, but uh, with the data stacked, I, I believe it's possible based on what I've seen with the ETC. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's exciting, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have one question from B. Hi, no, it's Fabio. I'm just using another, another account because the, uh, the other one is not working. Hi, Victoria, uh, very nice talk. Thank you. I have a very quick uh, follow up on the first question by Charlotte. Um, you, you said that you have two methods mm -hmm. and uh, if you had to choose one method for uh, ages of the galaxies, is there one that you, you would prefer or that really depends on the, on the galaxy? Um, I, I think that that's a hard question because Mostly what I've learned from using these two methods is that formation ages are just really difficult to constrain. And so like you'll see in, uh, yeah, like this plot, the method A really prefers a, an old early formation age, but method B um, doesn't necessarily. Uh, and this is, this is because with imaging, it's just really hard to constrain when the very first stars in a galaxy formed. Um, I think what I've learned from, from this analysis is that something like mass weighted or light weighted age is generally a better way to go. And um, I, 
I'm leaning towards uh, method my method B for for future analyses to use bagpipes and uh, and you know exploring more parameter space just because that seems to be the better way to do things. Um, and uh, also bagpipes uses a more sophisticated um, minimization method. Uh, it also makes it really easy to constrain um, uh, photometric and spectroscopic information at the same time. So yeah, that would be. That'd be what I say. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so unless we have one last question, uh, I think we can uh, thank our speakers again. And um, just a reminder that you, there are still, uh, I think, slots available in their schedule. So uh, feel free to contact them or sign up on their schedule to have a one on one meeting. Uh, thank you, everybody. See you next week. Thank you very much.